Uh, welcome to what is feminist now, cultivating feminist tactics. Um, I'm really sort of honored to be moderating this panel for this group of amazing women. Um, I knew when we began planning MobConf um, a few months ago as a conference for really DIY activism where activists could come and gather and not only have discussions about lessons learned and share resources, but also you know, create this space so that we can begin already organizing um, and developing tactics that uh, we needed to make sure that there was a feminist space within this conference. And um, so I reached out to some of these really incredible women um, to begin having this conversation and figuring out um, what's the right way to sort of curate a discussion about feminism. And um, I mean, the, so now, this is sort of a space to both discuss sort of the terrain that we've inherited, um, which, you know, is wrought with a lot of complexities, but then also try and figure out tactics in, in going forward. So what's happening right now is sticky notes are being passed, and you're supposed to write down on it um, the answer to the question, why is feminism important to you? And we're going to put it up on a board and hopefully take a picture of it, but also have a conversation about it. Um, because uh, right now, like my generation is considered sort of the post-wave feminism, which um, both, you know, sounds really amazing on one hand because it opens the doors for us to not, you know, put ourselves in a nutshell and say, you know, we are this single definition, but rather we're a lot of intersections and complexities and we don't have to, you know, be put down into one little time frame and one idea of what we are. But then it also, like, in the idea of post and everything, it puts this, like, really, really weird idea that feminists have always been fighting about making um, everyone feel like they want to disassociate themselves from the name feminist. So hopefully we can talk about that, but hopefully we can also talk about, you know, address all the different complexities we have in order to do real strong feminist organizing coming from a place of what we inherit, like via our gender and how society looks at us, and um, go towards that to fight all oppression, um, both the oppression that forces put on us, but also the oppression that we create. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, so introducing our panel, um, we have Alexa Richardson, um, and she is a home birth midwife and reproductive rights activist. She has attended over 200 births in the area, supporting women as autonomous agents in charge of their bodies and births every step of the way. Her work for abortion access includes crisis and financial counseling at the National Abortion Federation and clinic escorting. She has also conducted research on the imperial impact of the U.S.'s reproductive rights decisions on poor countries. That's Alexa. Um, and this is Leah Ulanzi. Um, she teaches women's studies and gender studies at MICA. She is currently researching the connections between militarism and sexualized violence and collecting essays for an anthology on third wave male feminists. She is slowly learning to incorporate strategies of nonviolence and conflict resolution into her feminist toolkit. Um, Shauna Potter, which is over there, um, site director of Hollaback Baltimore. Shauna is the only child of a single mother, therefore a feminist. She has been living in Baltimore since 2002, but has experienced harassment in countless cities while on tour with various musical projects. She currently screams for War on Women, is ordained to perform wedding ceremonies, and runs Big Crunch Amp and Guitar Repair with her partner in Life and Crime, a current member of the Transgender Response Team, and head organizer of 2011's Baltimore Slut Walk. Shauna is not satisfied, waiting for the world to change. And then we have Reverend Meredith Moyes, did I say it right? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Um, is an ordained old Catholic priest, writer, activist, commentator, teacher, and activist living in Baltimore City. This proud graduate of Morgan State University is the vice chair of Baltimore Black Pride and one of the former co-chairs of Creating Change 2012, the national conference on LGBT equality produced by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Um, Reverend Meredith's editorials and essays can be found in Baltimore Out Loud, Baltimore's independent voice for the LGBT community. 
Um, and then lastly, but far from leastly, um, is Hannah Brancato. Um, and she is curating a touring exhibition and series of art interventions for a project called Force, Upsetting Rape Culture. And that's a really short bio for her, but I want to say that hopefully she's going to talk a lot more about all the amazing work she does. And she was um, a huge, huge part in organizing this panel to come together. And I was really happy to work with her and also with the other amazing women. So, yeah. So how this is going to happen is they're going to both introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their work and, you know, where they come from and identifying as feminists, maybe, if they want to talk about that. <laughs> and then um, I'm going to put forth um, a few questions, both to them, but also to you. So, we'll go from there. But, take it away. I don't know which order you want to go in, so. Okay. <laughs> I would love to talk about how I came to feminism. I wasn't sure that's what we were... Um, Whatever. Uh, so, I, I, I think I'll try to talk about some of the rules um, about me. Uh, if that's okay. Um, I think, uh, so I work as a feminist ac academic. Uh, academia is a site of privilege and co-optation. Uh, it sets the stage for the dynamic and the danger of having privileged women speak for less privileged women. So, it, you know, I wanted that on the table right away. I have an example of that that I found very disturbing. Um, but I guess before, the good thing about being a feminist academic is I am a repository for the, the strenuous and sincere efforts of women over the years to formulate what our liberation entails for us and for society. Because it's not just about us. It's, it's not just about um, getting a bigger piece of the capitalist pie. It's about a better recipe. And it's about what's gone wrong and the poisons that are in the pie right now. And the way looking at gender can give us strategies for addressing that. So, uh, I got the sense from the organizers that one of the things on people's minds is, is the question of organizing across difference. Uh, and I know that's very much discussed here. I was just listening to a talk across the hall. That question goes back uh, to uh, the 1970s. How come we haven't gotten further? You know, that bothers me. We've made a lot of progress, but the question is still haunting us. So, I just wanted to read a little paragraph by Audre Lorde. Uh, from Sister Outsider. I don't know if this is familiar. Uh, okay, it's familiar to a lot of you, but not to all of you. So it's worth saying. Let's, let's revisit this. Um, uh, she wrote this uh, in response to a conference where she felt that black women were only present as tokens. Um, and she just basically said, white women, do your research, find the appropriate people. You know, don't, don't just whine and say, well, we couldn't find anyone. <laughs> okay, so. The future of our Earth may depend upon the ability of all women to identify and develop new definitions of power and new patterns of relating across difference. The old definitions have not served us, nor the Earth that supports us. The old patterns, no matter how cleverly arranged to imitate progress, still condemn us to cosmetically altered repetitions of the same old exchanges, the same old guilt, hatred, recrimination, lamentation, and suspicion. For we have built into all of us old blue old blueprints of expectation and response, old structures of oppression, and these must be altered at the same time we alter the living conditions which are the result of those structures, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. As Paolo Freer shows so well in the pedagogy of the oppressed, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us, and which knows only the oppressor's tactics, the oppressor's relationships. Uh, change means growth, and growth can be painful. But we sharpen self-definition by exposing the self we work and struggle together with those whom we define as different from ourselves, although sharing the same goals. Um, so that's from a, a great essay, and if you want to read the rest of the essay, it's called Age, Race, Class, and Sex, and it's in a book with a fairly unforgettable title called Sister Outsider. Um, one other small quote I wanted to read. Um, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him in his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. Um, so there's that idea that um, uh, one of the uh, interesting intersections I've found between feminism and peace studies is the idea that the master's tools have not really made us safe. What do we have to be afraid of by leaving you know, those tools behind, the tools of domination and war have threatened us and threatened our well-being and our survival. Why do we 
in some circumstances, still think that that domination and privilege will protect us. Cooperation will protect us. Privilege will destroy us. Um, so uh, we are not safe in the master's house. We do not have to worry about leaving it. Um, so I guess uh, since we're talking about tactics, and I'm a teacher, uh, one of the things I do to get people comfortable talking honestly uh, about their own place in the matrix of domination, which is one term that's been coined to talk, talk about this situation where there are multiple kinds of oppression, uh, and in any given moment, you don't know which is, is operative. We, we can all list the many different kinds of privilege and oppression, race, class, sex, uh, gender identity, uh, ability, etc. Um, I usually uh, give them a uh, fairly straightforward uh, discussion of um, capitalism and the way uh, race uh, is profitable in capitalism. Um, uh, for one thing, it uh, helps um, the white, you know, the, the one percent buy the loyalty of the white ninety-nine percent, you know, because you can you can get your share of race privilege that way. Uh, it it also messes up the possibility of coalitions, so it's great that way, um, and uh, it channels anger. Uh, instead of anger up, channels anger down. I don't know if this is so so clear that I don't need to say it to this particular group. But so we talk about how how race has been inscribed into capitalism. Then we talk about gender, and I think that the the virtue of that is that after you talk about it as a system and a game, people feel a little more comfortable talking about where they fit in, and there's less defensiveness and less blame, and it suddenly becomes very tragic, and we suddenly realize what has been taken away from us, all of us, in different ways. Um, and uh, another lesson I've learned in talking about privilege, uh, Patricia Hill Collins is a sociologist at uh, College Park. I don't know if any of you are familiar with her, she's great. Um, and she says, uh, talk about privilege and oppression relationally rather than comparatively. Don't get bogged down in discussions of who's more oppressed and why. It just doesn't help. Uh, but you can understand your oppression in relation to someone else's. Uh, a very simple example is the white woman on a pedestal is constrained in many ways. Uh, that's a, a form of, of, or constructing the white woman as, as fragile is, is, a, is uh, disempowering. And at the same time, that can be used to reinforce uh, the, the fear, the, the whole the black male predator, uh, sexual predator myth. Um, the, those two myths fit together, so they reinforce each other. So that's kind of a, a simple, or maybe simplistic example of thinking relationally, how these different constructions reinforce each other. Uh, so um, I, I, uh, I remember when I was uh, talking to a young black male at Hopkins, saying he was always harassed by the police when he walked across Hopkins campus, even though he was a student there. Um, so I began to see that his fear of being harassed by the police had some connections with the woman's fear of walking alone at night. Why do we all have to be afraid of each other? Um, yeah. So, uh, as just in terms of a strategy, I think that helps. Cut me off when I've. Um, I guess one other thing I wanted to mention, because I was preparing for this, um, I was looking around on the internet, thinking, "Gee, I'm sure smart feminists have come up with lots of groovy strategies." And I better, I better own up for this confidence, you know, because I have a lot of anxieties of professionalism. I think uh, that's that's one of the false loyalties that I think Adrian Rich and uh, Virginia Woolf say to discard is loyalties to institutions that you don't really believe in, and yet you get you internalize your self image. You know, so that's one of them. Anyway, so I was boning up, and I came across an article that seems to speak to what we're talking about. It's called. Speaking and organizing across difference, the multiracial grassroots mobilization of childcare workers, and it was by uh, a female sociologist. Um, and I wasn't able to read the whole article, but I, she gave a talk, and I was able to watch the video. And it's about a, a group uh, in Seattle, or it's actually a national group, which was talking about the Seattle branch of a group called Worthy Wages, which involved uh, white middle class female activists organizing <coughs> a group of home based child care workers who were working class, uh, predominantly black, but not entirely, some, some white child care workers as well, 
And so the idea of the activists was organizing uh, or helping to spark a movement for progress uh, by um, sharing information. And the child care workers themselves were very interested in getting respect and getting fair wages. Those were the two issues. Um, so I'm really for, high foregrounding <coughs> the, the class and race difference. And the reason I'm foregrounding it is that they didn't. In this day and age, all these years after Audre Lorde gave her speech, a group of activists went into a situation like that and they said, well, we're going to do two things, or three things. They said, we're going to help people find common ground. And they did that very effectively. All they had to do was a survey. And the workers were ready. They said, sure, we want wages. You know, sure, we want respect. Uh, and then the activists said, well, let's, let's help them get mobilized. They actually did really well at that. They got a movement going. Their third goal, they chose not to uh, speak out loud, to articulate. And their third goal was organizing across differences. And they didn't address it. And um, we are so trained in this society to pretend um, that we are not, on a daily basis, lacerated by the differences in privilege that we experience. That if you go into a group and you don't bring it up, it won't come up. We are so used to lying about it. Um, so uh, this, this particular group, surprisingly to me in this day and age, chose to perpetuate the lie by not breaking the silence. And in the end, what, what happened, which is also, I don't know all the details because I've only seen the presentation and I haven't yet read the article. What happened was um, two of the child care workers were sort of leaders in their group. And they, and they said, you know, we're overwhelmed, you know, we don't know how to cope with this. We would really like some of the um, professional training that you're giving the activists. The answer was no. Why? I don't know why. Um, I don't think there was a good reason why. I'm willing to wait and not trash another feminist uh, and, or organization of feminists and say maybe they had a reason. You know, I don't know. I'll, I, I'm going to head to the library immediately after this conference and see if there's more information. But in this little lunchtime talk, she chose not to give a reason. She just said, they had a hesitation. <coughs> yeah, this is a, she's smarter than me. That's the thing. There's all these women who are so smart. How can they get this piece of it wrong? Um, and so I was again thinking about privilege. And there she was. I was trying to think, why am I not impressed? You know, because, do we what? Okay. Just to, uh, so they, they did, she did have lots of great ideas about how scholars can work with activists and communities and how we can combine academic knowledge and, and subjugated knowledge and marginalized knowledge and, you know, da 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 da. I was really impressed. But then I just thought, even in the made for TV movie, the activists at some point would have said, gee, you're really, you're really working hard. Would you like me to watch your kids? Even in the made-for-TV movie, this would have happened. Uh, and so when she gave her talk, I kept thinking, why didn't she use some of her academic privilege to bring along one of these child care workers who was disgruntled? So that the only important question, which was why the whole thing blew up in their faces, could at least be put on the table. Uh, but no, it was, it was your typical academic lunchtime lecture. Da -da -da. Um, so I, I wanted to retitle her article, Speaking and Organizing Across Difference, The Failure of Multiracial Grassroots Mobilization of Child Care Workers. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it accomplished some things. Maybe the child care workers themselves will now uh, reorganize. Um, but uh, I, I, um, I was happy to see that this, this panel was set up to talk about the problems as well as the success stories. Um, there's a lot to learn from both of them. So I guess that's that's maybe enough. We'll come back. Thank you. Alexa? Um, sure. Uh, that was really great. <laughs> there's lots of cool ideas, some of which will tie into the stuff that I wanted to talk about a little bit too. But um, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, I do reproductive rights work and seeing like the whole spectrum of reproductive rights work as interconnected, um, understanding that there are really intimate connections between, you know, lack of access to abortion and lack of access to birth choices, 
and um, the kind of authority and dominance and hierarchy that's built into our medical system as a whole, which is you know one of many systems that is organized on a really patriarchal, dominant, hierarchical system that we can all work together to kind of be more fully human within in a lot of different ways. So, um, yeah, so I work as a midwife, um, a home birth midwife here, and I think after lots of different machinations of feminism and moving through it in different ways, I kind of ended up at direct service provision. So I've done um, a lot of work on abortion, uh, access to abortion, providing funds for abortion, counseling around abortion, um, clinic escorting and organizing clinic escorts in DC, um, and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of one approach, I guess, is to just provide services and um, really direct person-to-person -person provision. Um, and also midwifery is illegal here in Maryland, so choosing to home birth midwifery choosing to practice um, in an illegal state and uh, kind of put, you know, has been a really political process for me too, of seeing all of these systems are really interconnected. Um, it's the state, it's the medical industry, all of that limiting women's choices, reproductive choices, um, right and left. So, um, yeah, you kind of touched on some of that interconnection between all forms of dominance and gender and how, I think where I'm at with my feminism now is that like, I'm not really interested in pursuing like, getting access to things that men have for women. That is like not, not really exciting or interesting to me at this point. I want like a really different version of what it is to be human and how we can all interact in this space. I want like a work world that works for people to be human, for anyone to take time off of work to do things that are really important for us, that that's more value than, than kind of um, structuring things around the workplace. And, um, you know, I want to see in, the, in like feminist movements more support for things that women do. I want to see more support for women who want to have these babies. I want to see more support, you know not just for women who want to get abortions, which is mm -hmm. really important, but they're the same issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, a, yeah, it's not public property, you know, the kind of decisions that we make around our bodies, and we really need to be able to support each other, like, both ends of that, mm -hmm. both yes. ends of that spectrum. Uh, a lot of the women I work with are um, Orthodox Jew, uh, Evangelical families, Mennonite families, and groups like that, and their choices and their bodies are also censured really, really strictly. Um, let's see what other notes I made. Uh, yeah, so a lot of this comes down to, you know, the public versus private divide and the kinds of issues. Our bodies, our sexualities are still considered, you know, private terrain that shouldn't be kind of out in the open, shouldn't be talked about how we're birthing our babies, how we're not birthing, you know, how we're not carrying pregnancies to term. All of these things are still made really taboo as sexuality is still made really taboo. And, um, I want, and that's the same kind of limiting gendered repression that keeps, you know, different kinds of sexualities out of the workplace, that keeps different kinds of expressions of who we are gender-wise out of the public sphere. It's, all of that is really, really intimately interconnected. So we can support each other and we can see those things as really unified and really connected in terms of how we support each other and get behind each other's different struggles um, in, that, in that kind of way. So, yeah, I think that's most of kind of what I wanted to touch on. Support sexuality and abortions <laughs> and making babies and all that kind of stuff as one as one well. whole. Um, so, I wanted to talk a little bit today about a specific project that I'm working on um, that Corey mentioned called Force Upsetting Rape Culture. And so that um, is an exit art exhibition that started in 2010 at the Current Gallery, 
where uh, Rebecca Nagel and I organized a group show of artists that in some way were um, addressing rape culture. At the time, with the exhibition was actually called Force on the Culture of Rape. So the idea of um, showing people what, what is a rape culture, like what does this actually mean and what does it look like. So um, some of the pieces in the show were addressing the way that rape is silenced, the way that survivors' stories aren't heard. Um, also addressing issues of consent, uh, what, how do we define what rape is, addressing um, uh, uh, issues of uh, what queer people go through, transgender people, and uh, kind of the fear that surrounds our ideas about sexuality and sex. And breaking down the idea that rape um, is about sex when, you know, of course it's about power, right? Um, and so there's so many manifestations uh, in our visual world that kind of, you know, of course, advertising, um, everything that's around us every day, right? Attitudes, the things that, you know, we're talking about here, the systems that we're a part of. And so the exhibition was sort of meant to just point out the way that our visual culture perpetuates some of these things. And um, after doing the exhibition, something that Rebecca and I realized was that this is great, we had a great conversation, where else could this conversation happen? Uh, and we started to want to be a little bit more strategic about, um, so within the art community, that, that was an important space for us to have the conversation at the time um, in the, within the Baltimore art community. How can we kind of expand that? And so we're in the process of, we, we changed the name to Force Upsetting Rape Culture, so that sort of, um, you know, thinking about it in a little more of an active way, that we're doing something about it, we're not just defining it, but we're changing it in some way by, by you know, by highlighting it, by bringing light to it, and um, and we're proposing a tour of the exhibition to uh, universities across the country. So we're kind of thinking about, yes, that's within academia, but also within kind of the state school system, maybe the Greek system, um, to, to bring up a conversation that maybe we're in this room used to having, but maybe, you know, a freshman at, you know, the University of Florida is not used to having. Or if it's if or if it's being had, it's only it's staying in the gender studies department, right? And it's maybe not going outside of there. So that's that's kind of our strategy with the exhibition at this point. Um, and kind of linking up with that, I uh, I have a younger sister who's a sophomore in college now at Duke, and she did a project for one of her. I think it was uh, what was the class called? It was a it was a class about the history of feminism. Um, and for the final project, her class got together. They did a project called um, "Why do I, Why do we need feminism?" or "We need feminism." And it was sort of a photo campaign that ended up going viral. Um, they've gotten lots of attention. Basically, what it consists of is um, this class going around their campus and asking people, "Why do you need feminism?" The same type of question that we asked you all coming in here today. And they photographed people holding their signs about why they need it. And I thought that that approach was really smart, as opposed to saying, what is feminism? Saying, why do you need feminism? Because what it does is it breaks, um, it, it kind of breaks automatically through a lot of the issues that we were talking about, about not recognizing the intersectionality that we have to address. Like, it's not an option we have to address. When you start saying, defining feminism, you're kind of boxing it in as opposed to if we talk about why we all need it, it opens it up in a way, right? Um, and it, I think, makes it a little bit more accessible. So um, in terms of the way, I guess, the way that this is being addressed on the college campus, uh, I thought that that was a really good example. The other reason that we thought that force would be good on college campuses is that, you know, one of the elements of rape culture that we're bringing up is the issue of consent. And um, instead of teaching a sexuality, um, that's about kind of fear, or that's about um, like fear, fear of bodies, that's, that, that we can teach a sexuality, not just where we're um, inviting people to be able to say no, but we're also inviting them to be able to say yes. And that's a really important part of addressing rape culture as well. So um, we ended up starting a line of underwear called Yes, Consent is Sexy that, uh, you know, kind of and I wish I could show the pictures of it, but um, that encourages that encourages consent. Not that the underwear in itself is supposed to replace a conversation that we hope people are having with their partners, but that it can be a reminder or a kind of a fun way to start a conversation. So um, the underwear is a way for us also to raise money for the exhibition to try to 
get the tour moving. Um, and it's also an access point, right, for, for people who might not might not hear force of setting rape culture, I really want to go to that exhibition. But they might see a picture of the underwear and be like, oh, that's really cute and I want to know more about it. So, you know, in, in my mind it creates another access point for people. Um, so, yeah, that's the main thing that I wanted to talk about. I'm involved, I mean, I, I guess I got involved in feminism when I was working at the House of Ruth, which is a domestic violence shelter here in Baltimore. Um, and there I was doing more direct service. So I think of force and consent is sexy as being um, more, you know, kind of activist projects in some cases. Um, with the underwear, for example, we're going to be planting the underwear in Victoria's Secrets because of the fact that they have all of these crazy, um, they all have all of these crazy prints on their pink line, which is actually targeted towards young women between the ages of, I think they say like 15 and 22, that's like on their marketing report. Um, and they have all of these no means yes kind of messages on, on the underwear. So we're doing kind of guerrilla tactics like that, we're doing some education, but direct service is also really important. And so I, 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 am, I am coming out of this like with a background in more of an arts therapeutic space um, where, uh, you know, where I'm really interested in trying to create situations where people can share stories that are not often heard. Um, and the reason that I think that the art exhibition is a smart way to do that is that this space should happen in, in private ways, but it also should happen in more public ways so that we can all get more used to it. So. Um, well, first of all, my name is Reverend Meredith Moise again, and um, I come to activism from really, um, um, I started um, in Jamaica, Queens, New York, where I'm from, um, and my cousin and I started a group called CLIM, Commitment to the Longevity and Improvement of Male Blacks. And we came to that because a cousin of ours was murdered um, in front of this post office um, in Jamaica, um, Queens, and he had started reading uh, another <coughs> book called The Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys by Dr. Jalanta Kanjufu. And so being radicalized in that area and and really getting a lot of uh, what we call knowledge of self from hip hop, I was moved to join him in that. And then that was when I was 16. When I went to college, I really immersed myself in a lot of the black thought, uh, pro-black um, movements at that time, particularly in hip hop. But one of the things that I started to see, particularly in um, black spirituality movements that were non-Christian, particularly the Nation of Gods and Earths, also known as the 5% movement on Nation of Islam, and generally um, more orthodox Islam was the marginalization of women. And how um, women's talents were used to build these movements, but women were not encouraged to take leadership roles. In fact, uh, theologically, that was forbidden. Um, and even in some of the, the dogma of these organiz organizations, particularly the Nation of Gods and Earths, how, you know, in their theology, well, they wouldn't say theology because they don't believe in an uh, anthropomorphic God, if you will, but in their belief system, the black man is akin to God. He's the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, the father of civilization and God of the universe. But the black woman is considered the Earth. She's there to produce. You know, um, cosmologically, the black man is akin to the sun, and the black woman is akin to the moon. And so that position of supposedly natural subservience kind of permeates those cultures. And so when we see this, um, you know, in certain manifestations of hip-hop, we can understand where these languages, uh, uh, anti-woman languages, coming from. And so seeing that, you know, when I was in college and then going back to New York, and at that time I was coming out, and it was great being with a lot of gay black men <coughs> at the time, but even there I found a lot of misogyny, um, people not wanting to, people not wanting to enter women's space, converse, so you couldn't un, um, enter a uh, gay man's space. It was, it was just really crazy. And the thing that, you know, I was always taught was, you know, black people stick together, but within the black community there uh, is this dividing line between black men and black women, and roles are very clearly defined. Um, and this goes across the African diaspora. Uh, particularly if you look in um, Afro-Latino cultures, uh, Caribbean cultures, you do see very, very narrow definitions of what man is and what woman is. <coughs> and then you transgress those things, then it is marginalization on a number of levels. And so really just observing that, 
I, I kind of had to draw away from those things because I, it wasn't feeding my spirit. And so uh, becoming ordained in 2004 as a deacon and then um, uh, ordained to the priesthood in 2008, what I also started to see, um, and I give thanks to Spirit for really, really opening my eyes to these things, uh, just within the church. Now, it's one thing to see these things from outside the church, the, the marginalization of women, the degradation of the woman's spirit, but it's another thing to be in pulpits with people who think that you should not be there. You know, there are still spaces and places in this country where, and I'm not even talking about the Roman church, uh, particularly in black institutions, where women cannot be on the pulpit. You know, you can be there to serve, but you can't be there to speak. And this is uh, pretty much been given uh, carte blanche uh, based on somebody's interpretation of scripture, what Paul said 2,000 years ago. You know, people will give you various reasons why women should be marginalized. And I, and, and you know, just through a lot of prayer and meditation, what I realized was that when we look at, you know, this westernized view of God, broken up into Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, where is woman in that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so unfortunately, a lot of women fuel their own oppression because their view of God is male. And so, in really looking at uh, ancient belief systems, particularly the Ifa system, the European system, and its Caribbean derivatives in Santeria, uh, Le Kumi, um, Condomble, um, Kudu, and Rudu, what I realized was that before the creation of these uh, westernized religious systems, there were systems that embraced the male and female of God, or spirit, and knowing that spirit has no gender. And in these societies, um, there was a lot of, uh, I would say, equality um, uh, in certain aspects, you know. Um, and I think that's very interesting, particularly in the Ifa system um, from Nigeria. In that system, men and women can be high priests. But when this came to the West through slavery and its manifestation in, in Caribbean and Santeria and Kumi, only men can be high priests and women cannot. So I think that what we really need to play is if we're trying to dismantle systems, is the power that spirituality and religion play in the fueling of the oppression of women. Um, if we look at now and how the uh, Roman church is reacting to the nuns, most nuns, honestly, are over 60 years old. <laughs> so, what type of people are running a structure that would attack elderly women? <laughs> For helping the poor and the marginalized, clothing people. What type of moral fiber is this telling us? And I said to somebody today that all of this is being revealed so that people can fall away from that system, which is literally fueling the war cultures, fueling the rape cultures, fueling all of these things. I believe that everything we see is a manifestation of some type of spirit thing, whether you call it God, whatever you want to call it. But I also believe that in order to dismantle these things, that people need to embrace their unique spirituality. Going beyond the physical, going to the core of what it means to be human. Cultivating our humanity will be the key to dismantling these systems because these systems are based on oppression. But if we, we build our human spirit and if we, if, if we delve into our own spirituality, <coughs> Some people may want to follow a particular system of spiritualities or they may want to follow their own amalgamation. Whatever you choose, it is very, very important to build your life energy for this work and for this purpose. If we look at movements around the world that have overturned systems, most of these, systems, most of these movements were based in a spiritual world. Gandhi didn't just theorize, he went into spirit. Martin Luther King didn't just theorize, he went into spirit. Even when we look at the anti-slavery movements, these were built on spirit things. Yes, they were built from a Christian lens, but they were still built from spirit. And I think that going forward in the 21st century, the greatest weapon that we do have is love. And how do we cultivate that love? We have to go within. You know what I'm saying? I know that many of you may have been involved in occupying stuff, but what I want to know is who is occupying their spirit?
<laughs> Are you occupying your spirit? Because coming into this work, we all have baggage. But how do we move our own baggage out the way to serve a greater humanity? Uh, one of my mentors in life is uh, Dr. Gaisaku Keda, and he is the president of the Sokotaka International Movement. These are a group of lay natural leaders. And one of the things that he says is that the 21st century is the century of women. And how did he reach that conclusion? Because the powers that are here now are falling away in the, in the revelation of all their drama and cabals. I mean, stuff is coming out every day. So how do we react to that? Because one of the powers that these things do have is secrecy. You know, particularly as an old Catholic priest, before I became a priest, it was a lot of secrets around what was happening. <laughs> the collar was mysterious. And then when I became a priest and found out you could buy the collar for 25 cents. <laughs> you could buy a bishop's hat and party cents. It wasn't that mysterious anymore. And just going beyond the veil to look at the wisdom of Oz. That story in and of itself is an allegory of our society, particularly from a religious point of view. These people continue their smoke and mirrors game. Why? Because it is smoke and mirrors. And people give them power that they themselves possess. So how do you take back your power, you go within your spirit, and you cultivate your humanity? That is the biggest thing that we have to do today, is cultivate our own humanity. How do we cultivate compassion, true self and purity? Dr. Daisaku Kato also says that uh, he has this, has this notion of what's called human revolution. This change in a single individual can change a community, a town, a city, a nation and ultimately the world. And I think about what if Harriet Tubman decided to stay on that plantation in Dorchester County in Maryland? What if she just was like, well, I, this is my life and this is what's for me? <laughs> what if Martin Luther King said, well, you know what? I have this really comfortable life. I'm more house educated, you know, black, upper middle, middle class. I could just really chill in this church and be good. <laughs> but he chose another life. Gandhi really could have remained a lawyer in South Africa, and he really could have chosen that life and been comfortable in that life. But something stirred their spirits and allowed them to cultivate a humanity that is ever expansive. <laughs> So if we are to move these movements in a way that will not only dismantle systems, but actually save the planet Earth, we have to cultivate our humanity. That is the most crucial step that we can take to really move forward. And in terms of my um, view of feminism, I'm rather new to feminism because I do come from a, a black uh, power empowerment ex uh, uh, experience. And what I have realized is that if I cultivate my humanity, feminism is right there. The affirmation of the woman's spirit, the female spirit. There is yin and yang, and right now we are severely out of balance. So if I'm not in balance, how can I balance stuff out if I'm not in balance? So it's a daily work, it's a daily practice, and it's a daily walk. So that, that, that would be my suggestion. Cultivate your humanity. Oh, my neck hurts. <laughs> Everybody's so awesome. Um, my name's Shauna. I run Hollaback Baltimore. And I'll start with, I kind of started my journey in feminism just by having a single mom. It was just obvious to me. You know, she did everything that needed to be done growing up. So it didn't make any sense that men and women were treated differently. That's why I felt at a very young age. And of course, I just learned more and more as I go along about that. Um, and then of course, I got into the right girl <laughs> culture and <laughs> the 90s were a great time for us. And, uh, and I've tried to just hold on to that. Um, so I run Hollowback in Baltimore, but Hollowback is a worldwide uh, organization which is sort of run by local community members in each city. And what we do is we fight street harassment, which is sort of low on the totem pole of gender-based violence. Um, but we kind of approach it as like a really good starting point. Like if, if more people um, could show respect to strangers on the street, then 
it would very easily translate to, well, they probably wouldn't rape them, maybe. You know, if, if that was just, yes, everyone understands, you respect people's privacy and uh, treat everyone equally, then it would lessen all these other more serious crimes. So it's like a gateway crime to um, uh, violence, gender-based violence. So how we fight that is by allowing people that experience street harassment, which is mostly women and LGBTQ folks, uh, to participate in the ancient practice of sharing their story, right? Storytelling. I know that, um, uh, you know, where there's oppression happening within communities that are supposed to be uh, fighting oppression. So I guess that's uh, one of the things that I try to do in, in, my, in my work in my life. But one thing, you know, I'm very careful that of this whole self-policing. And I think that some of the issues around what you talked about is perhaps folks on the spectrum need to organize among themselves. Mm -hmm. You see, because if I, you know, for instance, this is a real conversation, Baltimore is 60% black and how many people of color in this room? Mm -hmm. You know, so we make choices where we're going to be at. And if I face exclusion from a particular place, do I seek to infiltrate the place and integrate, or do I start my own stuff? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And so I think a lot of times in our response to, well, I feel locked out, well, I'm going to start my own stuff, or be with others of like minds, because everything is not for everybody. And as Shauna just said, you know, we need to be really creative about this work. I had a professor at Moore that he, he said, he said, you know, if you want to dismantle white supremacy, there are a couple of approaches. You can either out, stand outside Pharaoh's gates yelling, let my people go, or you can be inside the palace whispering into his ear, let my people go. <laughs> you can be whoever you want at whichever time mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. And at that time at Morgan, I was one of the people outside yelling, let my people go. Now there I have been spaces and places that I have been in my present life that I have been next to policymakers whispering into their ear, let my people go. So my thing is, why do I have to wait for this community of people to accept me? You know, and is that because I want a sense of belonging? Or is there something else going on? So I would say that a lot of we you know, we've had a lot of good organizing among transgender people, particularly in Baltimore, among gender queer folk. And I think that like minds can do more. Now, I, I'm not into police of people or, you know, I'm not into that. But I think that it's important that if you if people don't find a space for them, they create that space for themselves. That is why Baltimore Black Pride exists. Mm -hmm. Because people came to one of the founders of Baltimore Black Pride and said, we don't feel comfortable at June Pride. There is no space for us. There is no space for black trans people. There is no space for black lesbians and black gays. They just did not feel included. When you're looking at the stage show and there's no black people, mm -hmm. but you want my black dollars, I have a choice. Do I continue to spend and fuel this or am I going to do my own? And so folks decide to do their own stuff and we're in our 10th year. And it's not that we don't love June Pride, I'll be there, I'll be in the parade. But I also know that in creating structures that support my own community, I'm augmenting, you know, and uplifting my uh, own community and augmenting my humanity as well. So I would tell your friends that maybe they need to start their own stuff. Um, okay. Are you on separate questions? I, I was on your question, but my question kind of spoke to all of these well, the first question was what, what what needs to kind of be continue to be put forward. I believe something along yeah, that line. Like, how do we? Move and and I, I think it ties back to some of the reproductive justice stuff and some of the kind of um, what appears to be competing movements, the trans movement and the the, the feminist movement, but. Some, some of it for me as a lesbian, lesbian but also um, who has done a lot of work around trans inclusion, I do think some of feminism is about, I have a uterus, mm -hmm. <laughs> and reproductive justice and feminism um, kind of call sometimes for female body spaces and women who are female body to come together. 
um, around those issues and what that means. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of overlap um, around oppression and a lot of intersection. Um, but we do need to talk about gender stereotypes and what that means. And if I want to talk about, I want to be a masculine, and I'm not, but a masculine expressing person and still identify as female and not feel pressured to somehow have someone assume I'm trans or whatever, sometimes I find that space in a women's only or female only space. And that's just kind of the reality. Other times when I'm working on queer or gender issues or intersections of oppression, I want to have my trans women sisters and trans brothers there. Um, so, I, but I, there is, I think, in the activist community, some bubbling, not even bubbling, fuming tensions. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it played out in some spaces that I just had to even walk away <laughs> from. I just delete, yeah. I'm done with this whole piece. Yeah. Um, and I think the same thing around um, intersections of race and sex and gender and all of that. But we've got some really dicey, difficult conversations to have, and the trans one is probably the biggest one we have to address. And I think, um, you know, really touching back on to the, the savviness of um, misogyny and gender oppression and reproductive justice is really one of the forefronts. The fact that this woman can be arrested for what she does <laughs> is, is really, you know, we've, we've got the prison industrial complex now going for her, doing a, an ancient healing tradition and a, a life supporting tradition is pretty scary. I just real quick building off of that because I know some people have their hands up. Like I, I think that one of the things that I've encountered in the short time, you know, the relatively short time that I've been doing this work is that it it, see, it does seem like people feel like, well, there's only so much room to have this conversation. Like people only have so much energy to talk about rape culture and you're not doing it the way that I wanted to see it done. And so I'm mad at you for that. And that's where I think a lot of the anger comes from. Like, it, And it's because it's pressing. Like, it's important and it matters. And, and I understand that. And I guess I, I do wonder about, like, how can we um, how can we just kind of allow room for, for those different approaches while also acknowledging that each thing that we do carries a lot of importance, you know? Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, echo what I you can said. tell that you teach because you're always ending with a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, were there other hands? I'm putting myself on the stack. Okay, sweet. Uh, do you want to go? Then I'll go. Sure. Um, I, I study feminist studies um, in school and, and really develop the sort of critical feminist lens, and I think that's important. And I think that that's one of the things that I also run up against in feminism, where we're like so mean to each other behind our backs all the time. Um, and I think that it's it's really important to hang on to that critical lens because that's like one of the foundations of the work is like really questioning how the structures are set up and um, how we're engaging with each other and all that stuff, but to also like hold really strong compassion um, for that. And, and I would also like to say, um, you know, and, and ask folks in here, how does that translate into work with across communities? Because you know, and Jackie can tell you, working in marginalized communities, multicultural and multiracial communities, sometimes feminism is a dirty word. Mm -hmm. When people think of feminism in, in spaces and places in African American communities, communities of the African diaspora, that means that you hate men. So how do we deconstruct that and empower women to ultimately, as the sister set up here, if you want to have six babies, have six babies, but does your husband need to beat you? You see what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> how, how do we how do we empower women across mm -hmm. this lens, you know, and not think that they have to marginalize the other because this is what they've heard that feminism is. So I would I would ask, how do we using your your uh, critical feminist lens? How do you translate that to Benito on 25th of Fremont? How does that work for her? How does that wor work for um? Um, Rosita in Fell's Point, how does that work for her? Because we all share the commonality of being women. So how can we move forward together using that critical feminist lens to bring women together to move forward? Um, so calling myself, then Kristen, <coughs> then, 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 then you, then me, then Kristen, then I, I, I work. Okay. 
Um, I think uh, masculinity studies is worth looking into because one of the first points that, that it, it really brings home is the idea that patriarchy distributes its benefits unevenly among men. Mm -hmm. So then you can very quickly move on to the idea that, that patriarchy is not really helping the need of husband. And that by embracing uh, that, that critical feminist lens, um, you can build a coalition between a man who is disempowered and is, is getting a kind of false power from dominating mm -hmm. the woman. It's not giving him anything that he really wants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, so, so that's basically what I think of. Thank you. Sorry, you're sitting right next to me. Um, uh, yeah, so calling on me, I just wanted to say, I think, you know, you know, as a young queer uh, person, like, who identifies really, really strongly as a feminist, I think about that question a lot, and I think it ties in um, into all these questions that we're asking ourselves about how we move forward into building movements and identities, and, um, I mean, I don't necessarily, like, have the answer in, you know, how do we create a world and a feminist movement and other movements that, you know, are more inclusive of, you know, trans folks and, like, cis women and whatever, like, um, how do we do that any more than I have, like, a clear answer on how, you know, we come up against things like classism and racism, because um, it's all part of, you know, this huge system that works to oppress all of us so that we don't, you know, be the fullest amount of people that we want to be. So, um, I think, I think I, addressing that and how, you know, we, like, it's not a big system out there, like, oh, the system, it oppresses all of us of the system. It's, you know, we play out these dynamics. Um, so, when, you know, when I see fellow feminists be, like, really horrible to, you know, trans folks, you know, it's just, like, duplicating an oppressive system that they've been oppressed by. Um, and so, it's kind of, as Meredith was saying earlier, one of, like, the strongest points of, I think, feminism is, like, strengthening your own humanity. And it sounds so, like, courty and touchy-feely, but it doesn't. I don't mean to, like, put it down, like, say it from my voice. It sounds beautiful from yours. It feels like, um, kind of, but it's, like, such a, like, you know, fundamental part of moving forward, because, uh, and I think also what I wanted to say is, like, in realizing, you know, your own oppression and how we oppress one another, um, like, I don't agree with all of what you said, Meredith, in your second part of the question, but I do agree that, like, part of, you know, being really inclusive and realizing that, you know, we are all, like, people that are oppressed in, like, various ways is also realizing, you know, the points in which we need to take space from one another and, um, and not, I think we should always be inclusive, especially, like, because I think a lot about it in terms of, like, you know, myself as, like, a white feminist who identifies as queer, how sometimes I should not organize with black feminists because it's not my space. But, you know, I want to work on, like, building different communities and different, um, different ways that the world works, but then I also, like, realize that sometimes it's not my place to, you know, join into, like, to swoop gender in. rights. What? To swoop in. Yeah, to, like, swoop in and organize, like, around all gender <clears throat> rights, because even though my gender is oppressed, it's oppressed differently. Um, so I think it is, like, recognizing the need to take space sometimes, and also, like, I have another thing that I think is important. Um, I mean, just, like, <laughs> I won't say, I mean, I think, like, um, I think always really realizing all the different oppressions that go on, because while I think, you know, especially right now, like, it's, you know, the question of how trans folks are oppressed within feminist movements is incredibly important. I, like, I want to address it to also, you know, trans folks and, you know, my genderqueer friends, like, how you are perpetuating oppression too. And I feel like by doing that, it also kind of opens up the door a bit to making it more inclusive, because I often feel, um, like, in, in my little tiny queer community, 
lesbian is kind of a dirty word. Mm -hmm. um, like it's like yeah. old yeah. and crotchety. And so, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so like if I say you know I'm a lesbian, it you know sounds really outdated and like you're putting a formula on mm -hmm. sexuality. So I think by trying to open up conversations about how we all oppress one another and why we all oppress one another because we are oppressed, it helps like open up the open up the door for us to not oppress one another. So that was my really long way to try to answer. So, Kristen? Yeah, I think that um, something that's been useful for me is not necessarily trying to define feminism as a common identity, but more like a common struggle against something, which takes on a lot of different identities. So, a common struggle against patriarchy, which like, plays into sexism and transphobia, homophobia, patriarchy, or whatever word you want to use as an overarching oppression. Um, will yield different um, spaces for people to come together in through different identities. Um, and I think that like it's important to recognize that feminism isn't the same thing as like womanism or something that's necessarily gender. And I think that feminism is something that like crosses spectrum of race and gender and there's important spaces within feminism for like white cisgender males to get together and talk about how they're affected by patriarchy and be supportive in that. So finding those like finding that common struggle and then making the spaces that are for different people to come together in different ways and not necessarily always for everyone to be in the same room doing that, but for both things to happen, I think is good. Start. We were just in the workshop together, yeah. and we were talking. The same thing always comes up: is like, how do you create a safe space for yourself, your little marginalized group, without being exclusionary? And I kind of came away with it like, you have to do both at the same time, you know. And that's kind of like a concrete, okay, here's an actual feminist tactic everyone can maybe walk away with: is like, you have to have a safe space for your group. Um, but you have to also build alliances or keep communication open and have an inclusive group and we have to all exist at the same time and then support that and keep each other in check when we don't really do it right and also believe that we're all coming from a good place and that it's worth having a discussion and not getting too defensive or offensive. You know? mm -hmm. So I can I just directly say what you said? <laughs> is that I think that the acknowledgement of like who we are in a room or when we're coming together in a common struggle or when we're building coalitions, uh, the, yeah, the, not, like it's okay to have a group who wants to just be all sister and women coming together and doing something. It doesn't have to be exclusive, but the uh, self-awareness has to be there that that's what's happening and that it's not different from a struggle that will include in the room like trans people. You know, like these different things have to happen, and each thing has to be acknowledged in a way that is an exclusive. So I love and then Dan. Okay, so there's did I say your name right? Eagle. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that have been going around, and I guess you said a lot of the. Um, no, I mean it's okay. <laughs> that I want to touch on. Um, I guess my main. I guess concern or the thing that I kind of always want to emphasize is the these gender roles that are so um, restrictive that we've all been talking about, and um, I think part of like part of the activism that we always have to sort of keep in mind is to um, remind people that these roles can be changed and that uh, they are very limiting. For everyone, and sort of like deconstruct gender, I think should be part of a uh, postmodern feminism or whatever. Um, because I mean that you know that touches on women roles, ma male roles, uh, the transgender community, the queer community, um, all these like labels for people's lifestyles or whatever you want to, you know. I mean it's just kind of ridiculous that it's gotten to the point where we have all these like names. Um, I'm not trying to be critical of the people or anything like that. I just think that it's because of how restricting it is to just be however you want to be. Um, and that kind of touches on 
what Reverend was saying um, <laughs> that I really, really like, and I think it's very important. Uh, we rarely, when we talk about political action or um, social action or feminism, we don't really um, realize that we're all human beings. Or, I mean, not, not that we don't realize, but we don't really focus <laughs> on the spiritual aspect of it. I think, especially in our society and in our culture, we don't really have a spirituality that is like our own. Mm -hmm. It's all these like institutionalized um, religions and these very transactional interactions that we have with each other. I mean, our culture is very um, um, sort of broken. <laughs> so I think that I would love to see a little more of a little more focus on that spirituality and cultivating our cultivating our humanity. I think it's like my favorite thing that you said, um, and build each other up with that. It's really important. Uh, something that I don't really hear uh, talk about as much, and uh, realize how our it's not like a system oppressing us. It's out there, like you're saying, but it's our relationships and how we relate to each other and just really being aware of that and helping other people reach that awareness. I think it's going to be really important because, um, you know, that's another form of activism that is in just your relationships with other people, just in every interaction that you have. That is very powerful. Um, and, yeah, I guess, I guess that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Uh, okay. okay. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, two people kind of said that they identified with something that was sort of a tainted word, and I just think it's important to recognize where that tainting comes from, and is it actual people, or is it just stereotypes and tropes, and if it is actually people, why do those mm, people who have tainted these labels, why does that, why do they overpower all the other people who would uh, identify as that. Um, the two people on the script that we're talking about are Reverend Meredith, so that feminism is going to be enclosed in that. Right, it seems like the, the, the patriarchal or oppressive system paints the idea of what a lesbian is or what a feminist mm -hmm. is, and then people that might identify that way distance themselves mm -hmm. and also talk poorly about it and then they're feeding into it. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, and I've heard some conversations about like, oh, like getting rid of uh, the word feminism, can't we just like call it something else? And, I mean I really I really feel strongly that we need to like keep you know, we need to keep it because part of it's I am glad that you said that Dan because I think that like part of the problem is that people are just you know, disassociating with it for a variety of reasons because it doesn't feel like it's for them, you know, but it does come back to this issue of it's, it really is because of the kind of dominant systems that have given it this or that stereotype that doesn't, that isn't necessarily true for people's lived reality of those identities and those, those words, so. Why including the history of feminism and that it started with a lot of oppression in it, of course it's going to have yeah, and just a bunch of white women, right. you know, and that's all that they heard about at the time, really. So I, I understand that, but it's also like time is, you try to share that? I, I think the dehumanization of women, particularly from my point of view, does come a lot from religion. And so how you dehumanize women, you make feminism and lesbianism a dirty word. Um, if we go back to what I talked about before with the nuns, the sisters, Part of the inquisition that they recently had was the bishops felt that they were promoting radical feminism. <laughs> <laughs> and you had bunches of women living together for years in certain places and spaces in certain community. And there is lesbian behavior in the comment. I mean, that's, that's a reality. So how do you dehumanize these women? You accuse them of being lesbians and women. <laughs> you know, institutionally. You know, for, I mean, there are a billion people in this in this uh, board called the Roman Catholic Church. There are billion people all over the world. And so my thing is, is that, you know, how do we literally resurrect, reconstruct, and cultivate our humanity in the face of this 
uh, juggernaut of chaos and destruction that has that has caused countless death, destruction, rape over the last two thousand years on the planet. And though that seems very daunting, I think individually we just kind of need to look at ourselves in the mirror and. And when we cultivate our own humanity, these things become clear. And again, it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. Life to life relationships change things. I would, I, and I'll tell you this, growing up in Queens, New York, Queens is a very segregated place. I grew up in a, a black community, Caribbean black, American black. The first time I actually sat in class next to a white person that was not a teacher or a nun was when I went to high school. And my eyes were open to the reality of what it was like to be Greek. What is it like to be Italian, Irish, or Jewish? Before that, I only knew that from TV. And so building relationships and friendships with people that I, I thought I had nothing in common with, what I realized was that what we shared was our humanity. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So when we build on that, then we can move forward. But also keeping you know, ever in the forefront of our minds, that a lot of this religious stuff is meant to dehumanize people. That's why it's easy for it's, uh, Muslims and Christians to go at it for the last 1,500 years because we dehumanized each other. And conversely, Jewish people have been dehumanized by bad theology as well in a, in a Western context. Um, so it's Derek and then Mia and then Albert. Albert. Um, but also, I just want to say we are out of time. So if anybody wants to go and have your lunch break, um, Please feel free. How long is the lunch break? Uh, it's an hour and a half, I think. Mm -hmm. No, it's an hour. I think the next session starts at 1.30. Lunch mm -hmm. break is an hour. Uh, so, yeah. A couple of brief things. I mean, one to respond to your question. I don't think this all comes from above. It comes from criticisms of what happened within feminism and what happened within especially political lesbianism as well. Um, you know, Mary Daly was virulently anti-trans. She was transphobic. Mm -hmm. She referred to trans women as Frankenstein. Um, Janice Raymond wrote an entire, her entire dissertation on, you know, rejecting trans identity. Sheila Jeffries still makes those kinds of points. Some women do hate, or some radical feminists did hate men. Some did argue for a world where we inverted the existing hierarchy so that women ruled over men. Um, sometimes people reject those labels because of what's done within the context of those labels historically. Uh, I think that's important to acknowledge, although I would never say that. Fucking crazy. <laughs> um, but the other thing is that I kind of want to challenge this idea that everyone goes and does their own thing strategically and tactically, and that's okay. There, there's some strategies and tactics that cannot possibly bring about a liberatory world. We have to talk about what our goals are, and if we share some common goals, for those of us in the room that are radical, we don't want to smash the state. I want to smash capitalism. I want to create a better state or a better capitalism. Some strategies and some tactics can never do that, ever, under any circumstance. That means being able to evaluate certain strategies. You know, when you say, you can't dismantle the master's tools with the master's house, like war, for example. War and the productive use of violence has led to liberatory struggle. Uh, including class struggles that's dismantled capitalism for a time, including anti-colonial struggles where colonized people have used violence in productive ways to you know, throw off the yoke of colonialism and so on. Um, I think that there's a place for, in fact, the vast majority of our tactics aren't going to be you know, violent and that kind of, those kinds of confrontational things all the time, um, most of the time. But on the other hand, when we start talking about legislation and running for office and things like that, there are certain outcomes that those things can never lead to under any circumstance. You know? and, and that has to be a strategic conversation, at least for those of us who can agree on those kinds of opposed to building. Yeah. Well, so we'll get to that. Every liberatory movement has debates about uh, whether to use violent methods. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, abolition movement had those debates, the civil rights movement had those debates, and they're all based on the idea that violence actually works. We, we make this assumption that, well, we're going to be nice people and we will be violent, but deep down inside, we know that, you know, as a last resort, violence is always there. And um, I'm just interested in theories of nonviolence that challenge the idea that violence really will accomplish 
the goal that you're setting out to accomplish. Uh, some people sort of do uh, historical analysis to show that um, when a movement comes into being through violence, a violent clique tends to then hold power and, and uh, dominance remains a core value. Uh, if you set up a regime, if the people that bring the regime into existence do it by violent means and then they retain power, um, very likely uh, there will continue to be a respect for hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy itself is a way of channeling uh, aggression downward. Uh, otherwise, without a hierarchy, people might challenge the people on top, but a hierarchy channels aggression downward and outward and scapegoats. You know, so I think uh, a movement that uh, accomplishes its ends through violence might be very likely, uh, unless, it, unless, like as the communists do, we say we need one personality type for the revolution and a whole different personality type to set up a new society. And I think that's very Machiavellian. Um, it's red tape, different kinds of problems. Well, yeah, but um, that's, that's <coughs> one position that I've heard. Um, and uh, I, I think I personally am, am, am really drawn to the idea, uh, you know, as Audrey Lord and other people have said, that we have to work on the oppressor within at the same time that we work on the oppressor without. So I, I just am not at all convinced that, that violence really will accomplish the goal that we want to accomplish. It might just set up a cycle of violence. <coughs> because if you, if you gain something through violence, you set yourself up for retaliation. It's harm. Yeah. I think this is an incredibly important conversation to have. Like, violence is a tactic, and I'm not sure that you <coughs> like, promoting it. No, I didn't just like, say that. Um, uh, so, okay, Leah? Okay, um, just uh, when he was talking about like things becoming dirty words, I thought about, I just finished reading Gender Outlaws recently, <coughs> um, and it was like a book of different stories from different people, and the first one was talking about how we're all like somebody's freak, so like mm -hmm. everyone, like even within communities that are like by mainstream society seen as freaks, like people try to label other people within the community as freaks, so like certain trans people might label other trans people who have to do sex work to survive as, you know, freaks or less than, to almost make themselves seem as more mainstream and, like, have power. Um, and it's just, like, one of those things where we're kind of duplicating, you know, the oppressor within, we're duplicating these power structures and uh, labeling other people instead of just embracing the way that everyone wants to, like, identify. And I would just say to that, that across communities we do that as well. So, as enlightened as uh, any of us in this room may see ourselves, we may not be really cool with, you know, the Orthodox Jewish woman's choices in her life and yeah. having, you know, eight or nine babies and, and doing all that kind of stuff. We may see that person as a freak. We may see, you know, black women downtown doing, you know, sex work as a freak, whatever kind of lines that somebody draws in their world that they're like, that those people are okay. Um, yeah, we gotta get like way beyond that as, as... Well, we're sold this idea that there's only so much success or freedom that you can have, and for me to have some, you can't have as much. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to take it from you, and, and that's the idea that needs to be rejected so that we can all be successful and free and right. liberated. Like we can all, like simultaneously we can all achieve that. It doesn't have to be in relationship to other people. And just on that, that like that. something that I've been thinking about a lot in the work that I do is like we need to learn to really trust that other people know what is best for them. Right? We don't know what is best for other people. Often they are the experts on on their lives and what is best for them and um, and to believe that, like, maybe this, to, to put our trust in those people, that maybe they've made choices to be um, the way they are, and that those are probably the most rational, best choices for them to help them support them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of that in, the, in what I would say the LGBT movement, with the whole marriage movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's now a, like a, a litmus test of, you know, if you support if you supporting marriage as a gay person or whatever, or um, a member of the LGBTQ ally community, that that is the measure of your gayness. I mean, that, that's really, that's really, a lot of that has, you know, permeated into the movement. And, you know, when I have said publicly, like, 
for many people, particularly LGBT people of color, marriage is not first on the agenda, then I get looked and cross eyed. And my thing has been, you know, um, I'll, I'm not saying that I don't support marriage, I do, but I'll be so glad when this is over so that we can focus <coughs> on bread and butter stuff that is happening in our community and that those resources that have, should I use the word hijacked? <laughs> they make into this movement millions of dollars into this movement when we can't even get a full-time drop-in center in Baltimore City for LGBTQ youth. I have a problem with that. And so hopefully we will win whatever we need to win so that we can get to helping particularly gay and lesbian and trans youth off the street and stuff like that. And I think that you said it correctly. It wasn't a fight that we picked. There were other people in other spaces and places that decided this is what was happening in Maryland and this now. this is important for you. And this is important, mm -hmm. right. And then when you said, well, no, I'm just really trying to eat right now, right. Yeah. then people have a problem. But um, hopefully, this, when this goes out to shore, we can get back to bread and butter issues. That speaks to shedding the master's tools, too, yeah. with marriage. So I just wanted to say, if you're leaving, if you could leave your sticky notes, that would be awesome, because we're going to put them up and take a picture of them and put them online. We're going to um, stick them on yeah, the wall. Stick them on the wall. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I wanted to say one quick thing before I call on Albert. Uh, just, um, you know, the radical would argue that he's waiting for that fight to be over in order to start the things you actually need is just like, you know, the hegemonic power is trying to distract you. We've already, actually, we've already started, it's already started in Baltimore, but in terms of the momentum needed to really get the resources and stuff, a lot of that has been held up because this whole idea of marriage among LGBT folk has, well, among people who support LGBT folk, like, you know, I'm supporting you, so I support marriage, that's great, but it is really like luck jammed up and locked up a lot of financial resources. And I'm saying that because I've sat in rooms with the power structures as kind of like the school who sat by the door and <laughs> heard them plan about millions of dollars diverted into different states for these movements. But I, you know, when I'm coming home from DC and seeing kids that I've mentored, I don't have a place to eat where I, you know, where I can get something to eat my mother put me out. So yes, the den has made phenomenal uh, movements that, that the den is a, a group that's working on creating safe space for LGBTQ youth in Baltimore. And they, they've secured space at the Gay Lesbian Community Center for a couple of days a week, right? Yeah. yeah. So that has been a movement, you know. But I would also like to see when this stuff dissipate that that becomes part of the consciousness. I mean, my thing with Ben Jones, it was great that the NAACP supported marriage. It was about time. But so now will you join with us in an effort to get a lot of these, particularly in Baltimore City and other spaces and places around the country, black gay youth off the street? See, is that a conversation that we want to talk about? Because now we have to talk about how the church is encouraging people to put their kids out on the street. You know, and it, and it confronts a very big power structure, in particularly the African American and Afro diaspora communities. It's really dealing with a lot of the malarkey coming out of the church that's creating unsafe environments for everybody, not, not just gay people. Just this community of silence around sexual health, people getting tested for stuff. You can't, you waiting for Jesus to hear you. Meanwhile, you know, you're on your last. That's, these are real situations. And so, I understand what you're saying, but I do understand how people think, and they got stuff in their minds that won't be moved until, I mean. Um, so Albert had his hand up, not to go to for task, but I do just want to say there's always going to be something that ties up into this. Anyways, Albert, sorry. Yeah, um, I, I didn't want to go too much, I just wanted to reinforce something that, that I kind of heard repeated throughout a lot of different comments and questions here which is uh, the role of interpersonal relationships in, in, you know, I mean, obviously there's larger, you know, patriarchal structures that manifest themselves in how we relate to each other, and so changing how you relate to each other can affect that. But um, tying in with, uh, with what you said um, about, you know, the importance of developing yourself, of developing your humanity, um, 
you know, humanity in a lot of respects is, is manifested and affected by your relationships hey, as well. So the, the role the role of relationships of how you choose to interact with people, how you approach other people affects the, the macro as well as the internal. You know, and I mean that that's something that has been, you know, fairly like rel revelatory in my life and my development is um, you know, how I approach other people, how how you know, in situations where something wouldn't be appropriate, you know, the benefit that I get of, of, of approaching it in a way that I'm conscious about, you know, in, in terms of my development and my spiritual development. And um, so I think tying back to the original question about uh, what what is needed, what, what like what what needs to be developed, is um, I would I would say that it's uh, sort of equalizing the roles of both identity and relationship. You know, and letting them be integral to each other. Are we fine with maybe breaking up and having, you know, smaller discussions and stuff like that? Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here and having such a good discussion.